Thank you, uh, thank you uh, to FINA for inviting me and present some of my research here this afternoon. Uh, what I would like to do is a very quick summary of some of the research we've been doing, but it's really focusing on young people, youth sport, and coaching young athletes. And, and uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the research that I will be talking about was kind of uh, the, the guiding principle came from, from a, a paper that we, uh, we wrote, an uh, IOC statement that was published in 2015. Uh, and then in that uh, position statement on youth sport, there were different areas. And the areas that I would like to focus on this afternoon is coaching, which was the part that I was responsible of writing uh, in that paper. So when, you, when we think about coaching, uh, coaching young athletes, I'd like people to think about I think a very important aspect of coaching is the acquisition of skills. So if you're coaching course, uh, coaching, sorry, a swimming coach, you want, to, uh, you want to teach skills, you want to teach strokes, you want to teach techniques, strategy, and those are a very important aspect of coaching. But the other very important aspect of coaching, especially young people, is to keep them engaged, to keep them, to develop that interest and, and maintain that interest. And a very simple way to look at coaching, you can think about three elements that is involved in coaching. And the first one is personal engagement in an activity. So as a coach, you schedule activities, so that whether it's training, practice, competition, periodizing, so all these things, and that's what helps you to develop the athlete. So that's the personal engagement in activities. The second aspect is the relationship the quality of the relationship you have with your athletes and all the relationship that there is in a, in a swimming club or in a program. So it could be a relationship between athletes and their parents, between peers themselves, but it's very important from a coaching perspective to entertain good relationship and to have those. The third one is appropriate setting. So sport is done within an environment, a physical environment and a social environment. So the arena, the pool, the club, the city, the country, are all aspects of coaching that are affecting ultimately at coach-athlete relationship and the athletes themselves. And all this occur over time. So coaching an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old and a 20-year-old, all these variables will be changing, but they're kind of the same, same big variables that will, but the relationship will change, the environment has to change, the activities have to change over time. So if we put this into some kind of a, an illustration of what it looks like, you can think of coaching as the dynamic elements here that are there on the, on the left side of the, so those are, so, so basically what sport is about is what, what I do with who and where. So that's coaching, that's sport. That's so, and then within that, we need to kind of play on those elements so that over time at the bottom here, you achieve some some positive things. And the positive things, the first thing that, that, that you can achieve as a coach is the development of those person, change the person. Change the person in terms of their competence. So you want to teach them strokes, you want to teach them the, the, the competence of, swim, of, of being a good swimmer, but also there's some psychosocial aspect that are very important in athletes and those could include confidence, connection, and character. And those four C's come from uh, developmental psychology. It's a model in developmental psychology that has been used for positive youth development. And we, we use them in sport to define what coaching effectiveness is about. And when you think about it, and I don't know if it's gonna make sense to you, but when, when we, we published this paper in 2009, and since then, people have adapted the four C's as really the immediate outcomes of you that you want to achieve in sport. As a coach, you want to develop competence, confidence, connection, and character. So the connection part is all the relationships and, and the ability to interact with others. And we know that every athlete has to have those kinds of ability, and as a coach, you need to promote that. And the, the character, I think, speak, speaks by itself. If you develop that within a season, then the ultimate outcome would be performance, participation, and personal development. And again, that's, so, so what, is the, the, what is the role of youth sport is to develop elite level athletes. It's to develop long-term swimming, people that will enjoy swimming, that's the participation part, or people that will keep doing swimming for the enjoyment, for the social aspect of it. And then we know that sport could be a fantastic way of developing, of developing people, personal growth, and that's the personal development. 
And sometimes we look at those three objectives of performance, participation, and personal development as conflicting. As a coach, you have six, seven, eight, nine years old. Do you want to develop an elite level athlete or do you want to develop somebody that's going to love swimming for the rest of their life? So that's the performance versus participation. The, me the main message of this talk is that before 13, 14, 15 years old, I don't think that we need to make a choice. And, and I'm going to give you some research, some support about this, in terms that we could combine those three ultimate outcomes into programs that would achieve those three objectives. So what I would like to do is look at each of these dynamic elements in the fir uh, sorry, oops, too many remote here. Uh, I think to me, coaching, that's what coaching is about. We've ta we, we talked a lot about long-term athlete development, but coaching is about also short-term. You want to see athletes that leave the pool, that leave your, your practice, that leave your training with a smile on their face, and they want to come back. So you want to develop on a yearly basis the competence, the confidence, the connection, change the person, and if you're able to do that, the three P uh, happen by themselves. So what I'd like to do is focus on each one of those elements and give you just a snapshot of the research and what we know and maybe some key messages for each of these elements and how they affect the person, the C's, and the P's. So personal engagement in activities. And what I'm going to do is I've tried to look and give you some studies that we did on swimming. Uh, and then here, to, make to, to, to give you the, the point about personal engagement and activities, I'll talk a little bit about the studies where we looked at engage and drop out swimmers. And you can look at the demographic here, but we had two groups. And there's not a lot of studies that have been done that have looked at dropout uh, in sport. So in this study, so you could see again the demographic, they were, uh, the swimmers were, were very similar in terms of training hours, in terms of intensity of training. and. They, uh, what we did is we, they, 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 they got into, uh, we interviewed them and we obtained some quantitative data about training patterns. When they started swimming, at what time they started their first training camp, the number of hours they spent training, the number of comp competition per year, all kinds of very quantifiable types of, uh, of data. So what did we find here between the differences between the engaged group and the non-engaged group? So what you have in this table here is you have some variable on the left side, and then you have the dropout and the engaged group, and then the significant level. So what do you see here is that the training pattern of the dropout, this, the dropout swimmers started dry land at an earlier age. They started their training camp, their first training camp at an earlier age, uh, uh, younger. Uh, they they, they did, the, the only one swimmer in the, in the dropout group took some time off while the other, while there were six in the engaged group. And then four of the swimmers switched clubs versus the engaged group, there was more switching around of different clubs. If you keep doing with this, other variables in terms of training patterns of the engaged swimmer and the, uh, and the dropout, uh, if you go to the bottom here, the two in red that were significant, the number of activities. So basically, the dropout swimmers were engaged in less activities. They did less music and arts and other extracurricular activities than the engaged swimmer. And deliberate play is this idea of doing swimming for fun, not necessarily to improve techniques, but for enjoyment and for fun. And what we've noticed in here is that the engaged swimmer had more of this type of activity for enjoyment earlier on in their career. So what does this say about training patterns and engagement and activities, well, it brings this ideas of early specialization. And I think uh, really what the data showed of this study is that the dropout group did fewer extracurricular activities. They got involved in swimming at an earlier age. They did less deliberate play. They had earlier start of dryland training and training camps. I didn't show you the data here, but they had, they had a, a close and extended and a very serious type of relationship at a very early age with, with a coach that was really kind of pushing them into more training. And they, uh, most often they were uh, the youngest in the group. So this is kind of a pattern of early specialization that we see in a lot of sports. And what it creates is sometimes it could create elite level athletes, but what it creates also 
is a situation where there's probably a lot of talent that is lost b just because people are identified at a very early age as being good or not good, and then they drop out, just like at the study that I showed. So lots of research has been done on early specialization, and here I give you some references. But the idea that early diversification and, and the amount of play, so doing different sport at an early age in childhood, and I'm talking here six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, doing different sport is, seems to be a healthy thing in terms of developing talents, in terms of developing uh, participation. And also the idea of play, the idea of playing for fun in, in, in team sport, but I in swimming it would be the idea of, of also enjoying just swimming for the enjoyment of it and not necessarily always to learn techniques and skills. So the idea here is that if you want to develop interest and skill in youth, spo in youth sport and youth swimming, you want to have diversity between sport and you want a diversity within the sport. So allowing the kids to do different things within their sport and not specialize at a very early age. The second component uh, of the model here is quality relationship. So you can be very good at creating those, those, uh, those activities, but the relationship that you entertain with athletes as a coach is a very important determinant of the, 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 the output in terms of the outcome, the ultimate outcome. In 2009, we published this paper on we, where we define coaching effectiveness. And basically what we said there is that we said that coaches have three different types of knowledge or behaviors. So professional, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. And that is linked to competence, confidence, connection, and character. So the professional knowledge or behaviors of coaches is, as a swimming coach, is everything you know about swimming in terms of periodization, in terms of training, in terms of set, in terms of... So that's what is usually taught in coaching clinics. You know, you, you, you want to be a basketball coach, you learn about basketball and not about training. The interpersonal aspect of coaching very rarely is taught. It's something that people learn by themselves, but it's the ability to relate, to communicate to athletes. And then the intrapersonal is the ability to reflect. And we know that effective expert coaches have this very well developed. They're, they're, you know, they screw up in practice, they do something bad, they're able to reflect, come back, and do something, and that's how people learn, that's how people become better. So the interesting thing here is that all the res a lot of the research on coaching have been really focused on professional knowledge. What do, what do I need to do to be a very good swimming coach? And we know very well that good, if good coaches in any sport would provide a lot of instruction, they'll provide positive and supportive feedback, they'll minimize the use of punishment, and they will avoid being negatively affected by different uh, contextual factors. So that's good, and I think you can be a good coach by doing this, but when you think about sports and what sport can do for young people, it can do a lot more than that. And this is the idea of interpersonal knowledge. This is the idea of interpersonal behaviors. So how could you, as a coach, help people become better people, better citizens, and contribute back and give back to, to the sport and to society? Because not everybody will become an elite level athlete. I think there's about less than 1% of chance of becoming an elite level athlete. So can, you, can we take sport and really as a coach transform the athletes, giving them some tools that they could apply outside of sport and in their life? If we're able to do that, I think that we got a good, I think there's, a, there's very good uh, opportunity here to do that in sport. So I want to talk a little bit about transformational leadership, <coughs> which is a theory in business that really talks about this, this, this idea of empowering and inspiring people for their personal development. And what uh, transformational leadership have is four dimension. So uh, the dimension of idealized influence, inspirational motivation, intellectual stimulation, and individualized consideration. So those are kind of the precursors of behaviors of coaches that would have an impact on the competence, confidence, connection, and character, and on, on, on performance, uh, participation, and personal development. And this is some of the research that we're doing right now, and I'll just give you here, we did an interview with an expert swimming coach that really this idea of transformational coaching came very clearly. And this is a coach of one, probably one of the best coach in Canada in, uh, with, uh, for swimmers with disability. 
and she got the Order of Canada, and she is she she's running a club that produce Paralympics, but also that are that are, that have athletes that develops as uh, as people that don't know how to swim, and she has all these people in the pool at the same time. Very successful coach. So. What you see here is I just put the four I of transform transformational leadership, and next to each one, you can see some specific behaviors that this coach would do that, is under, that would fit under idealized influence or inspirational motivation or an intellectual stimulation or individualized consideration. So the, the, the tricky part here, if we want to teach coaches or if, you, if we want to try to get communicate that interpersonal skills are important for coaches to acquire, we need to be able to identify those behaviors and we need to get coaches to adopt most, more often those types of behaviors. And this was the start, but there's a lot more research that uh, would support this and there we're, we've been doing a lot of observation research where we film coaches and coach athletes relationship in youth sport and try to see the behaviors that makes a difference in terms of development and personal development. So we do kind of longitudinal studies where we look at a full season, observe coaches at different times during the season, give athletes some questionnaires and that allows us to measure the personal development. And what we found with this, this is, this is a, uh, our uh, coding system, but we found some very specific behaviors that coaches display all the time and that seems to have a fantastic effect on athletes' personal development. And I'll just take a few minutes here, but when you think about idealized influence, what we've been able to show is that coaches that discuss or model pro-social values or behaviors with their athletes would show this idealized influence. The second one there, showing vulnerability and humility. Effective coaches, coaches that makes a difference in their athletes, they will be able to acknowledge when they make a mistake and they will tell the athletes, oh, sorry, I screwed up yesterday or I did this and then, but, but that's the kind of, and that's idealized influence. So very, so those are very little behaviors, but behaviors that make a difference in the kid's life. When you look at inspirational motivation, basically it's providing meaning. How do you provide meaning in swimming? How do you, when you bring your athletes, when coaches bring their athletes, how do you do that? Here's some, some ideas here, some behaviors or specific behaviors, dis discussing goals and expectation, expressing confidence, promoting team concept, and providing rational and explanation. Really, really giving a sense to the athletes of why are they there, why are they doing this, and that is inspirational motivation. Intellectual stimulation is a big one, and, and coaches say they do that, but when you observe them, they don't do that very much. And, and if here it's the ability to raise questions, to, to really get your athletes engaged mentally into the act. And then, so some be specific behaviors would be sharing decision, making leadership responsibility with the athletes, and emphasizing the learning process with the athletes again. And then the last one is individualized consideration. So which is really trying to get to know the athletes at a personal level, and that is huge. There's one study that we did where that was the difference between a very effective coach and a less effective coach. The only thing that was different is that the very effective coach was talking to his athletes during practice, just go, this was basketball, just going around and say, uh, uh, how, how's your homework? Did you watch a movie last night? What kind of movie was this? Just getting interested in their life. That was the difference. The only type of behavior that was different between the two types of coaches. So showing interest in athletes' life and recognizing accomplishment. So what we're doing now is we have, a, we have a workshop where we train coaches. It's about three or four hours looking at those behaviors, those specific interpersonal behaviors of coaches, and through illustration, case scenario, videos, really getting coaches to think about how can I get this a little bit more in my coaching. And this is... This does not require more time. You don't stop a practice and say, now we're going to talk about your life. It's just something that you do throughout the practice, but just getting recognized, becoming aware of these types of behaviors on the right makes a big, huge difference in athletes. The last one, uh, okay, I just want to talk here. Just a, a very short quote of the, uh, that swimming coach. 
I think my basic philosophy, and it's grown over time, is person first. People get that confused with swimmer first or athletes first, but it's person first. I want them to see success, not just in sport, but in the whole pathway along their life. So really the idea of coaching the person and, 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 and the idea of transformational coaching, transformational leadership. The last, uh, the last element that I'd like to talk about is, is the setting. And it's a bit hard to get your heads around setting, but think about setting as kind of the, 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 the big thing around, around coaching. So it's the clubs, it's the city, it's the country, it's the environment, the physical and social environment. And, and we know that the setting could have a, an effect on, your co on the coaching and also on the athlete and on the C's and the P's. Here we did, so, so again, the idea is the setting could have, could, could especially in youth sport, especially at a very young age, the setting could have a very important impact on part performance participation and personal development. So the, the one study, so we did a lot of studies on, on uh, looking at environment. I'll just talk to you very quickly about this one which was in swimming, we wanted to examine the developmental assets of adolescents. So basically we were asking swimmers what they get out of their experience in swimming. And they were just filling out a questionnaire. Whoops, I'm sure I'll go back. So we wanted to determine here the environment to see if there's a, a, a relationship between community size and adolescent sport dropout. So basically between the size of the community in which you swim or the size of the club, so bigger community have bigger clubs, and smaller clubs. Is there a difference in terms of environment and what it creates? Because we found this in other studies as being a very important factor. So what we did here is we had uh, a number of athletes between 12 and 19 years old, uh, more females, but we had two groups, a group of dropout and a group of uh, still engaged uh, swimmers. We gave them a developmental assets questionnaire and we, tr we looked at which, where they came from. So the city size and the club size in which they come from. And we classified them and it, was a, it came about half and half. They came from b cities that were more than 500,000. We call that large cities. And cities that were less than 500,000 people, we call that small cities. And generally, the, the, the big city swimmers came from bigger clubs while the small city swimmer came from smaller clubs. So they filled out this questionnaire of developmental assets and you can see the, the results here. So on the left side, you have those components of the questionnaire. What did they get out of, so if we, if you are a, a swimming coach, you want your athletes to get as much a, a score as high as possible on support, empowerment. So all these things you want your athletes to develop in swimming or in youth sport. And what you notice here is that the swimmers in smaller city seems to have a more positive experience in swimming than swimmers in bigger city. And the interesting thing here is that we did a regression uh, analysis where we look at odds ratio between uh, and, and try to see which one of those variables predict better uh, w would predict better the full model and then what we notice here is that as age increase and I think that's kind of an obvious one as age increase there's more dropout so that's the first one but the interesting thing here is that people there was close to five times more uh, people in bigger cities that 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 uh, that was going to, that were going that dropped out in the study. So they came more from bigger city. So the idea here, and there's a lot of research. So this is just the swimming research. We there's a l seems to be a lot of support in different countries, different sport that that gives us this environment where you have smaller clubs, smaller cities seems to be promoting sport in a better way than, than bigger clubs, bigger cities. And you see it, we saw it in a lot of different countries and a lot of different sport. The, pro the issue here is not the size of the city. And, and really that's not the point. The point is what is happening in those smaller cities, smaller clubs. And I think we could recreate that in bigger cities, bigger clubs for sure. But the point would be, and I try to, to summarize it in here, would be that probably in youth sport, accessibility is more important than, uh, than, than quality. So 
think about smaller cities, you know, and you don't have to think about swimming, but think about other sports or, or swimming, just the, the fact that you don't have to travel too far to go to, to swimming. Th or, or these, these, all these kinds of, uh, they may be, there's probably less distraction in smaller cities. Uh, so accessibility, very important, and not necessarily quality for young, young kids. I think that's an obvious one. Maybe smaller uh, communities have, have uh, are s psychologically and physically uh, more safe, but you know, coaches that, have, that are kind of accountable uh, and provide psychological safety. The environment that promote diversification and play. Uh, I think in team sport, you see that a lot. And the, so the, uh, the, the, the basketball court where, where kids can just play for fun and it's not always organized. Uh, the integration of, s s very often in smaller communities, smaller clubs, there's a better integration of the values of the family, the coach, and very often you know the coach and the parents, and then there's this kind of accountability that, again, that is very important in terms of positive development. And the last one point that I wanted to make here is that there's been quite a bit of studies done with big high school and smaller high school showing that a setting with fewer people increase involvement in different roles and personal effort. And the idea here is, again, if you have a big club, it's okay, but how can you create those more community and responsibility and accountability within that? So, almost done here. Just want to summarize, so you saw this, this is coaching, and really what coaching is about is this, the, dev the development of interest, the development of skill, and really looking at those three dynamic elements of activities, relationship, and settings as really the being the core of what you do as a coach. And I just want to finish with this. So the first one is the gear in terms of personal engagement and activities. Diversity between sport, diversity uh, within sport would be a very important component. The quality relationship, think about transformational coaching, transform the interpersonal behaviors and, and integrating that in coaching. And the last one is appropriate setting in terms of safety, age appropriate, accessibility, integration, and then in terms of height. So thank you very much.